Hi, I'm Anne. Welcome to or welcome back to my channel. And today we are going to be trying to decipher this book, Jonathan Strange and Miss, Mr. Norrell by Susanna Clark. So I just finished this book last night and I want to process my thoughts here on this channel with you because this is a big book. It's almost 900 pages and it is a book that does not really fit into any specific genre. So I wanted to break down what exactly it is. Do I think is it worth reading this long a book? As well as just kind of trying to explain exactly what this book is doing or trying to do. So Jonathan Strange and Mr. Nora came out a decade or two ago. There was a mini series released on BBC for it. Uh, and it's a pretty big book that a lot of people have hyped. Um, the reality is though, there's a lot of books that are hyped that don't necessarily deserve the hype. And there's a lot of very long books out there that don't necessarily need to be that long. It is part a historical fiction, but more so it is a magical, it is a fantasy of alternative history. The premise is basically, it follows these two magicians, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, who live around the Napoleonic era. The book, I believe, starts in 1807 and it ends in 1817. So it follows a decade of their life as they attempt to aid England in the war with Napoleon using magic, as well as bringing back magic to England that has been lost along the way. Um, there is chaos and very interesting things that happen. So the book very much starts off with Mr. Norrell. We do not meet uh, Jonathan Strange until uh, the later, at least like 100 pages in. Uh, Mr. Norrell is very much a very particular gentleman. He is obsessed with his library and buys up every book he can find about magic. He hoards it in his house and doesn't really let other people who are curious about magic read it. There is also this whole society built up out of the idea that magic is dangerous and magic should not be performed. It is only the idea of learning about magic and the idea of learning the history of magic that has benefits to the modern, as one would say, society. And so you have this constant upstream battle that Mr. Norrell is fighting to make his work taken seriously and to get the benefit um, get into the good graces of the King of England and the powerful houses and powers of England. And then Jonathan Strange comes into the picture. Jonathan Strange is introduced as a young man. He is recently going to be or soon to be engaged um, to Arabella. We meet him when he has no interest in being a magician. He never even considered that. And he meets this strange man on the road who predicts that he will be a great magician. So what does he do? He decides to learn magic. And eventually he learns that he can't really learn magic from books considering Mr. Norrell has all the books and buys up all the books that anyone has and nobody else has access to these magical books. So because of that, Jonathan Strange becomes the student of Mr. Norrell. And then the story continues. Um, the description I gave is very much the first, I'd say 200 to 300 pages of the book. So the first like quarter of the book, the setup as you will. So let's talk about the interesting things that this book tries to do. It is very much presented as if it were a historical fiction. In many ways, it is similar, I was reminded at least, of Charles Dickens writing from, from the Victorian era, where there are very detailed, elaborate, long descriptions. There are these pictures that are throughout the book uh, that are reminiscent of the Victorian pictures that you would find in historical books. Something like this. Um, but there are also uh, a lot of footnotes, some that are extremely long. And these footnotes are to develop the world more, this fictional, magical world, as one would say. I would say what makes this book very unique when it comes to genres is that it is as much reminiscent of a historical fiction book, a classic 
Victorian novel as it is to a uh, epic fantasy, um, which I have read both very long books, both classics as well as very long epic fantasy and they this book is a mix of both where you have the more mysterious magical elements the idea of fairies being mischievous and evil but then you also have the elements of the history the pr perspective is very much told to the reader it is if you are learning a history of all these characters as opposed to getting straight into their heads and really understanding the uh their thoughts and understandings so you only have what you are seeing in that sense the book is written almost as if it were a movie um so you're not seeing into the characters um heads to understand exactly what they are thinking when they are making their choices however you can kind of understand by the context of the narrative as well as their previous actions what they said why they are doing these things so in, in that sense the book I think it feels a little bit detached for someone like me who reads a lot of classics who reads a lot of like Victorian novels like Charles Dickens that narrative style did not feel foreign to me because I've read so many classics but I think a modern reader who is reading this more for the fantasy elements may find this book very difficult to um, read and also very boring because it does get into this fictionalized history it does get into all these um, scenes of high society of the Regency era that a lot of like modern fantasy readers would not find interesting. In that sense, this book has a very specific audience because it has to be an audience who is both interested in the fantasy elements, but also interested in the historical, this alternative history, this, um, a fanciful Victorian type style of writing. And I think that is why this book in many ways is divisive. I've heard a lot of people say it is an exceptional book. A lot of people say it is a horrible book. I personally fell a little bit in the middle. I found it to be interesting to read, but I did find it to be very, very long. And I struggled a little bit with just how detached a lot of the characters were and how a lot of the times I didn't agree with their choices. And because we were seeing the sight of everything from above, from far away, we saw things that the main characters were not seeing. We saw things that Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell didn't discover till the end of the book. Book. And because of that, it was frustrating along the narrative because you wanted them to know this and you wanted them to solve this and you knew this, but they were making decisions that were opposite to achieving uh, a good ending to the story. I have to also talk about the main villain of the book, who is a a very nuanced villain, but I feel like in order to talk about him, I have to give a little bit of spoilers. So we are going to be going into light spoiler sections. I don't want to spoil the very ending of the book, but I will be spoiling probably the first half or a little bit over. Um, so if you're sensitive to spoilers, just click off the video now and read this and then come back if this sounds like a book that you would want to read. So the main villain, in a sense, is this fairy. He is called the thistle, the thistle haired gentleman throughout most of the book because he has this white hair. But he is a fairy, very ancient, and he has very specific ideas about humanity. In the beginning of the book, Mr. Norrell summons him to save Lady Pole, this young woman who died uh, right before her wedding day, and her soon to be husband convinces Mr. Norrell to bring her to life, to use her powers and to prove his powers by bringing her to life. And of course he does, but in order to do that, he makes a deal with this fairy, call merely called throughout the book, The Gentleman, that he will have half of this woman's life. So say she lives to be 80 and she's 20 now, that means she's 60 years left. The gentleman will have her for the last 30 years of her life and she will in essence die. Uh, younger, but she will still have those 30 years that she wouldn't have if she remained dead. Of course, the gentleman doesn't exactly keep his promise because as you know, you never make a deal with the devil and this gentleman is basically the devil and he decides to not take Lady Pole, but force her to every night join this magical dream world. So, so there's this place 
Uh, in the book, it's referred to as several different names, but I will refer to it as the King's Roads. It is a mirrored world within all mirrors that is this magical fae-like world, but it is this flipped, this strange world. And Lady Pole is forced to go into the strange world at night and kind of her soul is slowly consumed by that world. Um, Mrs. Strange, who is the wife of Jonathan Strange, also gets pulled into this world a little bit. And again, these are spoilers for the first half of the book, not the ending of the book. And the gentleman also pulls in Stephen, who was like one of my favorite characters. So Stephen is this like black servant who works for uh, Lord Pole, Pole, who uh, gets pulled into this world and the gentleman becomes convinced that Stephen must become the King of England and prove that, you know, racism is bad. <laughs> it's, it's quite strange because like, in a sense, you agree with the gentleman because you're like, yeah, Stephen is actually a pretty amazing character. You like him from beginning to end. He's like a great character, <laughs> but you're also like, the gentleman is pure evil. So while you agree with him on the fact that Stephen is awesome, you can't agree with him that, yeah, like he's gonna murder all these people in order to make Stephen King of England. Like, I was conflicted about that. But so you have the gentleman pulling all these people into his dark, twisted world. And then you have Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell trying to make um, magic kind of acceptable in modern society and also make it, um, uh, needed in the Napoleonic Wars. So there's one point that Jonathan Strange goes to, uh, I can't remember if they're fighting in France or Spain, I think they're fighting in, um, Lord Wellington. Jonathan Strange goes to help the battle and goes on the front to like, for example, make roads for the army to make it very easy for the army to travel across Spain, as opposed to like travel through like mud and dirt and it slows them down. So there's all these ways that he benefits the war effort. And so you have Mr. Noro and Dr. Jonathan Strange trying to like, make magic presentable in society and make it better. But then you have Mr. Norrell very much wanting to like keep his magic to himself and not let other people use magic. And then you have Jonathan Strange saying, basically the more magicians, the better. So of course, eventually they come into conflict with that. And then of course you have the gentleman who is totally separate from Mr. Uh, Mr. Norrell and Jonathan Strange, who is doing all his conniving and horrible stuff. And then you have the plot lines come together by the end, of course. Uh, but so you have a lot going on in the book, but you also have a, a lot, very slow movement in the story. Chirdemas, of course, is my favorite character. He is the servant of Doc, uh, Mr. Norrell and the hero of most, most of the book. He's Dr. No because Mr. Norrell is very much like caught up in his obsession with his books and magic and his library. And um, Chodamas is very much more practical. So Chodamas is like the best character in the book. But so there's a lot of side characters. There's a lot of people to um, follow, but there's not that many. Like if you read Charles Dickens books, very much in Charles Dickens, you usually have a medium array of characters that is introduced, some of them later than others, but you don't have like new characters constantly coming in and a wide array of characters as much as you do in like an epic fantasy. So in that sense, the book feels more like Charles Dickens. Like if you've read a Charles Dickens book or you've read like Wilkie Collins and you are not overwhelmed by the amount of characters, you will probably enjoy this. For example, the book, um, which is actually behind this, War and Peace, um, is a lot of characters to keep track of. And that one is incredibly difficult. But where it, when it comes to Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, it has that modern sense of reading and writing that you, you can't just like introduce people constantly and be absolutely overwhelmed. Um, and I found, I find that classics do that a little bit more than modern books. So I feel like this is in, on the easier side of like a classic type writing but I'm blabbering on way too much. Uh, in the end, I gave this book four out of five stars. I enjoyed it. It was an interesting ride and I wanted to see where it went. And I enjoyed how such an epic long book was condensed into one book because I feel like it's very easy 
to make this into a series and I am glad that it's just one condensed narrative. But I'm curious, have any of you read this book? This is my first book by Susanna Clark. So have you read any of her other books? I feel like this has a very specific reader that it is geared towards and a lot of like modern average readers would not enjoy this book. So you need to be a very specific reader who um, likes long winded classics like Charles Dickens, but who also likes more like magical mysterious elements. So does this describe you? If it does, you should probably read this book because I think you would enjoy that enjoy it. I enjoyed it. I don't see myself ever rereading it, but I am glad I read it once. So have you read this book? I'm curious to know your thoughts down in the comments. Uh, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, like subscribe, and I will see you all in the next video. Have a great day. Bye.